close your eyes, please. Close your eyes and imagine yourself in a dark place, very dark. You can't see in front of you, but you know very well that you need to move. It's scary. You start walking very slowly. It's too dark, but you believe. You believe in yourself. And then suddenly, a beautiful golden light glows through your chest. And it starts lighting the path, bit by bit. And as you move forward on this dark road, where the path is lit by this golden light from your chest, you feel more comfortable. And then you keep moving, knowing that this light is supporting you. Suddenly, the light in your chest burst, burst out so strongly that it lights up the whole space. And you breathe. You breathe. You are overwhelmed. You are happy. And you can't believe that you just landed in your wildest dream. It's a beautiful, beautiful feeling. And then you start noticing the things around you, the light the colors, are there people around you or are you alone? Look very closely, remember the details of that dream. And as you're looking around and discovering the space, you start noticing your own feelings, your own emotions. you're finally there. And that feeling is exactly what you need to remember. Now you open your eyes and you realize that you're just in a theater. But in fact, your dream is more powerful than any reality you are in. My name is Muriel Abourouz. I'm a daydreamer mainly, but uh, I'm going to tell you a few stories which will share with you a little bit the child that I was and the adult that I've become. I was born in 1974, one year before the Civil War, and then the Civil War starts, and as a child, it was more a game for me. I run to the shelter, go to school, run back home, hide, jump. I mean, it was like really a, a big uh, tornado of of things we needed to do to survive. But in my, I mean, I was born with a genetic defect. I mean, dreams were for me more a strong reality than any, you know, chaos, chaos or, or, or um, fear surrounding me th during the war. So I used to dream a lot all the time, which was not good at school. Teachers did not appreciate it. And my mom did not appreciate it because, you know, when I used to, uh, take my dictation test, a few sentences were missing from the dictation because I could not remember what they said because I was too busy dreaming. It started in kindergarten. So I used to go to school when there is school, in between bombing uh, uh, times, and I used to come back and tell my brother, my little brother, who is not yet at school, that I was playing all day long with ducks, rabbits, monkeys, chicken, cats, dogs, like we had a little zoo in the school. And he believed me. I mean, I believed myself as well. And he started crying and he told my mom, I want to go to school with Muriel, I want to see the zoo, I want to see the animals and... 
I'm like, yes, let's take him. Why not? We went to school, and my mom told me, if you're lying, you're going to be punished. I'm like, I see them. Not my responsibility. So we went to school, and my mom arrives with me and my brother and says to the information desk, good morning, we're here to see the zoo. And the lady looks at my mom. I know she did not know what to say because you know, she's a respectful lady. What can I tell her? I mean, Miss, ma sorry, madame, but this is a school. There is no zoo here. And my mom looks at me like this. And I'm like, it's not my fault if they can't see them. <laughs> and I was very serious. I mean, my mom started getting worried. Am I delusional? Am I, you know, maybe the schizophrenic, living in a different dream? in different realm, in different world, but for me, it was my self-defense against the dark. It was an act of revolution. It was an act of self-love. Why should I accept your collective ugly reality while I'm a child and all I dream of is beautiful, amazing things in the world? Well, thank God I made it through school and the war. So the war ended, school ended. What should I do? I'm going to go to university. What shall I study? I mean, I never really thought about it. But what I really was looking for was freedom. So I saw a few students jumping up and down, crazy hair, torn jeans, you know, expressing themselves. And I was like, whatever they're studying, that's it. And it just happened. It was audiovisual at the St. Joseph University, and I was like, Mom, this is what I want to do. She said, fine, OK. She knew by then that it was uncontrollable, and she could not say no. We went, and the first year was amazing, until we had a great financial crisis at home, no money at all. We couldn't pay tuition. She came to me and said, you cannot go the second year, because we can't pay nothing, I mean, nada. You cannot pay anything. I mean, you, ha you have to stop. And I'm like, not in my reality. I went. The day came, I needed to pay. And they're like, Muriel, you need to pay. And I'm like, I don't have money. I used to go by foot to university, spend the whole day not having even 1,000 lira to buy a manusha. But I was happy, because I was exactly what I wanted to be. So I went to social services. I had an appointment like a few days later in order to see what was the choices, what was the options that I had. And meanwhile, until then, for these two, three days, I was all the time visualizing in front of me, written on billboards, on buildings, on the ground, in my food, full scholarship. That's the only two words that I was dreaming about, daydreaming about, uh, like being aware that this is what I'm projecting into the world. I go to the meeting with a beautiful letter, a lot of passion for the arts, and a sentence in the end that says, don't try to give me pay payment facilities. Don't try to tell me that, you know, you can pay 50% or 20%. We have no money. Just tell me. You're going to give me full scholarship because I deserve it, because you're going to be proud that you supported me, because I will be famous and I will be, I do good things in the world. And they said, fine, we need to study the situation. There is a board of committee. And usually, they don't give full scholarship unless you are first in your class. And I definitely was not first in my class. Still, daydreaming. So two days later, or I don't remember, three, four days later, they call me. Can you come, please? We made a decision. I go there, Mabruk, full scholarship. I never doubted. The day I went back from that meeting, before they told me their answer, my mom asked me, so what will you do? And I said, I got full scholarship. And I did not get it yet. Because for me, what I decided to do was exactly the reality I will manifest. I had no doubt about that. I got full scholarship, party time, went to university, finished, and now another dream. I want to be a cinematographer. Okay. 
I go to the production houses and I say, good morning, my name is Muriel. I just graduated. I want to be a cinematographer. And they say, Habibi, this is not a woman's job. This is a man's job. The camera is heavy. There is, are no women cinematographers in the Arab world. I mean, be an assistant director, be a production manager, do something women do. And I'm like, what? I mean, what do you mean it's not a woman's job? Well, they said it's too heavy, it's a big responsibility. All the foreign DOPs were bringing DOPs, me and cinematographer, director of photography. We're bringing them from abroad. There are no women involved in that uh, field. And I'm like, fine. If it's a matter of strength, I'm going to go to the gym and pump some iron. I went to the gym, did that, did the assistant director part. It went very well, but I got bored. A year later, I tell them, listen, I got bored. I don't want to be the police on set. I just want to be the cinematographer. I mean, give me something. So I decided to become a lighting assistant, which means I used to clean cables, lift tripods, you know, do the physical thing with the guys. I mean, there was 12 guys and I was me. I mean, I would used to carry th things that are heavier than me, but they had my back and they were amazing. A year later, I got a chance. I shot a short film, which won an award for best cinematography. And this was my window into becoming the cinematographer I wanted to be. I did that. And then I said to myself, great. Now it's time to shoot a feature film. So I started dreaming all the time. All the time, I mean all the time. When I say all the time, it's a commitment. That at the age of 30, I'll be shooting my first feature film. Feature film is a huge responsibility for any uh, head of department in filmmaking, if you know about that. And I used to visualize myself running to the set where I am the cinematographer of a feature film. And at the age of 30, I shot two feature films. And I celebrate my birthday on the set of the first feature film ever that I have shot in Yemen. It was the first ever Yemeni feature film. So that exercise was like, oh my god. I mean, I visualize, I believe, I water my dream, and then I become the dream. This was the process. And it's not like I tried it once or twice. I do it every day of my life. And I keep dreaming. I'm 48 years old today. And every year, I have a new dream that I want to become, not to achieve. Dreams are stored inside of us because they have a message. They carry our purpose. So when we go to become our dream, it's not for our own uh, ego. It's you become the dream because this is part of your purpose. This is part of your journey. We are here on Earth for a visit. And that visit carries magic. And that magic is inside of us, like this light that was glowing and showing you the way. And standing in front of you here was one of my dreams as well. And it just happened that the beautiful Jamhur youth invited me to be here just so I can share with you what I'm sharing right now. And I'm doing it not because I want to be on a TED Talk. I'm doing it because I want to share with you and remind you of the beauty that lies inside of you. Because anything is possible. And you and only you can set limits to what you can or cannot achieve. So to the parents here, please support your children. Because we need them to be happy. Please, no matter how delusional you think they are. I was one. I'm still one. Please support them in their dreams because if they're happy, there will be no war. If they're happy, we build a better Lebanon, a better future for humanity. Please support them. And for the parents, in case you forgot about your dreams or maybe put it on the side because you gave more priority to other things, please remember it's never too late. The more happy we are, the more peaceful the earth will be, and we can breathe. Thank you so much.